Okay, so today we are uh, really excited to uh, introduce to you a, a series unlike what we've ever done. I don't think we've ever done a series that covered this particular text. Um, but we're calling this series Remain in Me. And the title of today's message is Joy Filled Living. Joy Filled Living. I want you to think for just a moment, if you would, about maybe someone you know or maybe knew that was just an incredible man or woman of God, so full of, of God's Spirit that they were just overflowing with a joy that no, uh, you can't get from this earth. You can't get from living this life. I'm talking about a joy that just only comes from God. We knew a person like this. We've known many, but one particular person came to our mind when we were developing this message, and that was a, an incredible, wonderful woman by the name of Sister Pool. Her name was UD, and she was in her 80s, and she was a professor of ours in Bible college in Joplin. She uh, grew up in California, and her and her husband were, were ministers and pastors, and they traveled and did kids' camps. They planted a, uh, a summer camp, church camp for kids in, Cal in Southern California, just outside of Los Angeles, uh, like like back in the, in the 50s, I think, 40s or 50s. Just an incredible, incredible woman. When you met her, you just felt God's presence. You, you just, there was something about her that was just so drawing. She just drew you in with her love and with her smile and with the spirit and the presence of God. I remember uh, every single, you know, time we would go to class, she would begin class with this little tradition. And it was to sing a song. And many of you will not know what this song is. Some of you, I guarantee, will. But she started with this song. And she wanted the whole class to participate. And it was this. Smile a while. And if you know it, sing it with me. Give your face a rest. Lift your hands to the one you love the best. Then what? Then shake hands. And she would make you do it. Then shake hands with someone near and give to them a smile. You know it. And, you know, at first I thought, this is cheesy. But then I... I, I, I just began to get drawn, I was drawn into her love for God. She was so contagious. I wanted, I was saved. And I'm like, I don't feel like I'm saved when I'm around her. I want more of whatever she has. And that whatever she had was Jesus. She, she loved God with all of her heart. She was completely infatuated and obsessed with the Holy Spirit, with his presence. And you could tell it when you were around her. She had so much joy, it didn't matter what she was going through. Some of you might say, that was my grandma. Every time you went over to her house, you know, her Bible was on the kitchen table, and she was a praying woman. I've met so many people through the years. Grandma was the rock. How many of you guys had a grandma or a mom that was the rock of the home, just a godly woman? That's what I'm talking about. And in today's text and in this series, um, we want to talk about how do you get there? How do you get to that place where you are just overflowing with the presence of God? And today, more specifically, we're going to talk about the joy that only comes from the presence of God. You see, the mistake I believe that so many of us make is that we begin building our lives on happiness that is really only temporary rather than building a life that is purpose-driven and brings God pleasure. And that's the kind of joy that we experience in our life only comes from living a life that's built on him rather than a life that's built on us. I like what King David said in Psalm 16 and 11. Let's look at it. He said, you, God, you make known to me the path of life. See, most of us try to design our own path, yeah. right? Only to find out at the end of that path that it didn't pay off, yeah. right? Sister Poole did not have a ton of money. She wasn't rich. She wasn't famous. She wasn't known all over the world. She didn't live in a huge, big, beautiful mansion. She didn't drive a fancy car. 
She didn't have any of these things that we would seek to apprehend or get a hold of to define our life, but she was filled with joy. Why? You will fill me with joy in your what? Your presence. That's where joy comes from. With eternal pleasures at your right hand. You know all the pleasure that you really want? All of the pleasures that you really want, you know where they are? They are at the right hand of the Father. They are in his hand. The pleasure and the joy that only comes from God is found in the presence of God. Happiness is a good thing. We all want to be happy. But happiness is conditional. It has to do with our circumstances. It's a, it's, a, it's a temporary state of being that we experience while we are here on earth, right? Let's take this frappe, for example. This was not my plan, but these frappes make me happy because they are so stinking good and they are sugar-free. And so if you were to buy me a fr- I'm not asking you to buy me a frappe. Okay, I can buy my you own frappe. You only have one in a day. Because so. I only have one a day. I can't handle a triple shot of cold brew. Um, but I'm just telling you, this is so good, and it makes me happy because it tastes good. If you were to take this frappe away from me, which I would highly recommend you not try to do. But if... <laughs> You were so demon-possessed as to try to take my frappe from me. I would not be happy (laughs) anymore because my happiness is conditional and it's based on the things of this earth. My kids make me happy going for a long drive and rolling down the windows and then she yells at me because her hair is getting messed up and then I crank on some music. That makes me happy. The other night we pulled in the driveway. I said, hey. Dance with me. So I turned up brown eyed girl and rolled down the windows of the car and, and got in front of the headlights and I grabbed her and we danced. That made me happy. While our kids were throwing up inside the house watching us. <laughs> yeah, they're like, Bleh! out the window. Bleh! But there are things in this life that make us happiness is great. It's wonderful, right? But it's temporary and it's earthly and it's conditional. Joy is completely different. Joy is not happiness. Let's look at what joy is. Joy is an eternal, unconditional, constant, immovable, unchanging gladness that comes from one's deeply rooted love and oneness with the Lord Jesus Christ. So no matter what's going on in your life, No matter what's happening in your season that you're in or your circumstances, you can be overflowing with the joy of God because it comes from him. It's eternal. It's not of this world. Joy is your spirit's response. You see, you're you're made up of body, mind, and spirit. It's your spirit's response to knowing God intimately, the same way that Sister Poole knew God intimately. I like the old song that says, this joy that I have, the world didn't give it to me. The world didn't give it, and the world can't take it away. My prayer for you today, if you have not experienced the type of joy I'm talking about, is that you would learn to lean in and grab hold of what I'm talking about because there is nothing like it. You might be saved but you are not overflowing with the joy of the Lord. And I want that for you. And today's text that we're going to dig into is going to show you the formula for experiencing such joy. That's right. So we're going to go to the book of John. Some of you might've been ahead of us and you knew where we were headed. John 15 is where this thought comes from. Remain in me. But before we get there, I want to kind of lay the context for you so you can understand what's going on because it's not okay to just like cherry pick a verse out of the Bible. You really need to understand what was happening before this was said, what was happening after this is said, that's called context. Okay. So when we look at John chapter 14, 15 and 16, we see a dialogue that Jesus is having with his disciples. Very interesting. The timeline, it is the night before he is going to die. Okay. If you've ever sat with someone Before they pass away, it's like the last moments of their life, maybe the last few hours of their life, and they say anything, okay? I've been with many of my relatives as they were taking their last breath, and I can remember vividly their last words, whether it was days before 
or hours or minutes before. And guess what? You hold on to that memory because it meant something, right? I remember my grandma, as she was getting ready to pass away a few hours before she took her last breath and met Jesus, she prayed a prayer on her deathbed over everyone that was in that room. Amazing. I, I was much younger and I was like, if I could be half the woman that my grandma was, Like I would be accomplishing something great. But the fact is this was Jesus' last words before his death. And so I would say to myself, this is really, really important, okay? This is like he's taught them now for three years. He's told them all of this stuff, but now he's like, okay, I've got a window of time and then I know what's happening. I'm going to the cross. So he's trying to explain to them what is about to happen to his own life And he wants them to be okay because he knew why he came. He came to die so that you and I could have life. But of course, his disciples don't understand that. So in John 14, he begins to lay it out. Then you come into 15 and basically he is starting to help them to understand the promise of the Holy Spirit that's going to come. Okay, so he tells them, I'm going to die. I'm going to resurrect and then I'm going to leave. Of course, this is going all over their head. Anybody ever raised a teenager before? Okay. And you've had those conversations, those really meaningful, like you're really trying to help them to understand something about life. And you're like, this is really important, right? And you just know it's going right over their head. I mean, eyes are glazed over. You're like, you're going to need to know this. Would you listen? I think that's what Jesus was doing right now. But they were listening, but they just weren't grasping it. And they were saying, we don't want you to go away. Like, dude, you're the rock star. Everybody's following you. Like, we've got this crowd of people. You're doing miracles. It's amazing. Why would you want to stop? And he's like, you don't understand. I've got to go away so that the Holy Spirit can come. Because right now I'm on the outside. Like, I'm physically right here in the flesh, right here, Peter. But when I go away, the Holy Spirit is going to come back. And he's going to live on the inside of you. So he starts trying to tell them this very complicated part of the Godhead, God, the father, God, the son, I'm here in the flesh, God, the Holy spirit, go to John chapter 15. Let's see what it's all about. Jesus starts and he says, I am the true grapevine and my father, he's the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit and he prunes back those branches that do bear fruit so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Verse four, remain in me. You're gonna see this theme throughout this entire passage. Remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot bear fruit If it is severed from the vine and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Now, for you and I, we don't live in an area where there's vineyards everywhere. So perhaps you've never even seen a grapevine. But in this culture, the disciples clearly understood what a vine was. There were vineyards around them. This was very, very normal in their culture. So when Jesus taught, oftentimes he would teach through a story or a parable or an illustration. And if he was going to use an illustration or a metaphor, he wanted to make sure it was something they understood really clearly, okay? But for us, sometimes we actually have to go back and do some study to understand like the context and the culture because we don't live in that area. Now, if you were in Napa Valley and there were vineyards all around, this would be easier to understand. But here's what you need to get. God talked about vineyards and vines all through the Bible. From Genesis chapter 9 to Revelation chapter 14, all through the word, you see him talking about vines and vineyards. But in the Old Testament, he always referred to Israel as the vine. Not only was it the vine, but they weren't producing the good fruit God intended. Now, let me just ask you a question. If you had a fruit tree in your backyard and you gave it a few years and it never produced any fruit, what would you probably do with it? You can talk. You might prune it, but let's say you prune it. It still does nothing. What are you going to do with it? Probably tear it down. Try again. You know, you're just going to chuck it off. Like maybe that one was just bad, bad DNA. Like cut it down. Let's try again. Well, that's what was happening in the Old Testament. 
So they understood, but now Jesus changes the terminology and Jesus says, Israel, the Jews, you're not the vine. He says, I am the vine. All right. He's changing it up. Why is he doing that? He wants them to understand in that moment, I'm the source of life. Up till this point, you've been trying to do things on your own and you haven't been doing such a great job. It's like your life before Jesus. Like you can try and try and try to be happy and you can try to have joy, but it's all circumstantial. But when you have Jesus, the old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. He's helping them to understand I'm the source of life. So let's move into verse five. John 15, it says, yes, I'm the vine. You are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do what? Nothing. Nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. We're going to cover that verse in another message in this series. Verse 8 says, when you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my father. How many of you guys want to bring great glory to your father in heaven? He wants you to produce much fruit. I have loved you even as the father has loved me. Remain, there it is again, in my love. When you obey my commandments, you remain in my love just as I obey my father's commandments and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled with my joy. So you see, Jesus gives us the formula for how to live a life that is overflowing with the joy of the Lord. Yes, your joy will overflow. So I want to show a picture of a grapevine if you haven't seen one before. We see here that, and, and keep in mind the the picture doesn't show this, but God is the vine dresser. He's the gardener. He's the one that, as someone said, prunes. He's the one that, that cuts uh, branches off and discards them and throws them away. But Jesus is the vine. He is the, he is the source of strength. He is the source of power and we are the branches. So we are connected to him. He's connected to us. And if there is a oneness with God and abiding and remaining with him, then fruit comes forth. And how many of you guys like grapes? I love grapes, green grapes, purple grapes. It doesn't matter what color grape. I love grapes. They're good. They're healthy. And so in our life, God wants us, as you see through this text, he wants us to be fruitful. And in fact, the word says be fruitful and multiply. We see that earlier uh, in the word of God. And it's mentioned actually two different times. And so we should have this deep desire in our walk with God that something should be coming forth from our lives. Something should be giving back. Something should be impactful to others as we're living this life here on earth. But keep in mind, the key is found in this passage, 10 times the word remain pops up. 10 times we see this word remain. So what does it mean? All right. The Greek word is meno. And it means to remain, to abide, not to depart, to continue, to be present, to remain as one, right? To remain as one. Something about Sister Poole is that, man, she was one with God. She loved God so much. She spent so much time, not just in her personal devotion, not, not just in, in, in reading the word, but in prayer continually, I'm talking, she was always giving thanks to God. She was always talking about God. She was always thinking about God. She was constantly just in a state of just infatuation and obsession with God. Did you guys ever have somebody, you know, in high school that you were just in love with? You know what I'm talking about? Nobody, none of you. How about our online family? Right? You know, you know that... You know that, that, that point where you get in a relationship where you're, you're just like, you're just infatuated. All you can think about is the other person. You know what I'm talking about? Raise your hand if you, <laughs> Kelly Kassire goes, because he's the man, that's right. I remember one night during the time when Misty and I were uh, 
denying that we were dating. We were best friends. We were inseparable. But she was traveling, and uh, we were on the phone. It was like 11 o'clock at night, you know. And you know those conversations where you're like, so what are you doing? It's like, nothing. <laughs> what are you doing? Nothing. There's like zero value to the conversation whatsoever. But the fact that you're just on the phone, right? Thank you. I'm getting some head, some head nods. Do you know what I'm talking about? I'm talking about you are in love. And you don't care what you're talking about. It doesn't matter what you're talking about. You're just, you're just in it, you know? And you think about the person constantly. And you're just obsessed, right? And then you get married and you live happily ever after, right? Is that how it works? Something like that? <laughs> Next series is a marriage series. Just saying. <laughs> That's what Jesus wants with you. He wants you to call him up to not even have to talk about anything. He just wants you to be infatuated with him because guess what? He's infatuated with you. He wants that oneness. He wants that deep yearning relationship with you. He is crazy about you. That's what that word remain means. He wants to remain in you. He wants you to remain in him. He wants you guys to be so one that nobody can tell you two apart. And when that happens, when you get to that point where I know Sister Poole was, your life will have no choice but to begin to bear fruit. You're going to be full and overflowing, not just with joy, but with love for others when it doesn't make any sense, you're like, why, do you, why are you treating that person so nice when they're so hateful and so rude? It's only Jesus. It's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience. Some of y'all are saying, I need me some of that. <laughs> patience. You want to know where it comes from? It comes from the overflowing presence of God. It comes from you being the branch and Jesus being the vine. And that fruit that's going to come forth when you are abiding in an obsessive relationship with Jesus, you're going to have patience on the end of that branch. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, all the things that deep down we really want to be and do in this life. It only comes by being one, by remaining with him. In verse 5, it says, apart from him, we can do nothing. That means in your marriage relationship, it will not amount to anything unless you learn to abide with Jesus. Jesus and your relationship with him is what causes your marriage to, gain, to produce good fruit. In any relationship, if you want it to produce good fruit, you have to abide, you have to remain with Jesus. In your parenting, if you want to bear good fruit, you're going to have to abide and remain okay. with Jesus. In any part of your life, in your finances... In managing your time, in any area of your life, if you want it to amount to anything, you have to learn to be one with Jesus and abide and remain with him. Because apart from him, you can do nothing. Verse 11 goes on. He says, I've told you these things so that you will be filled with joy. And that joy is actually tied to recognizing, look at all the fruit that's come forth from my relationship with Jesus. Now I have joy. I am overflowed with joy. It's just coming out of me. I'm so excited because guess what? My life is meaningful. It's impactful. Why? Because I'm connected to the vine. My life means something. I have joy. That's what I want for you. That's what I want for me. We're in it to win it. Let's do this. So in that last passage in verse 11... Jesus is giving them, he's, he's done this whole dialogue and he then ends with these things are what you need if you're going to be full of joy. So how many would agree you want a life that is full of joy? No matter what circumstances happen, right? No matter what is going on in your life, you're not this emotional roller coaster. We've all met those people. We don't want to be 
that type of person that when the bad things happen, we're down here in the mully grubs. And when the great things are happening, we're up here on cloud nine. We as believers want to be this steady, stable, constant in the world. All right. That's what God wants for us. But how do we do that? Jesus laid it all out. So let me break it back down from this passage. There were three things. Number one, he says, if you remain in me, here are the benefits of remaining or abiding or being one with me. He said that you will produce much fruit in verse five. You know, I think a lot of times when we talk about the fruit of the spirit, it comes from Galatians chapter five, 22 and 23, Brad quoted them all. We think about it being something like, yeah, I'm supposed to have patience, man. I'm not good at that. I'm supposed to love people. And I'm really honest. I'm just annoyed by people and like goodness. And we have to like, honestly, we have to think about the things that we're supposed to produce. Do you know that's backwards? It actually isn't something that you should have to think about producing. It's that when you are connected to the source of life and you are one with Jesus and the Holy Spirit is now on the inside of you, he's indwelling you. You're having just a constant communication, this relationship, this infatuation. It just naturally is what's produced. You actually realize that you become more and more and more and more like the people you spend the most time with. As parents, it was very evident raising our children. Who you hang out with is who you will become like. So we had to make a choice early on to say, hey, if they don't have the same values as us, we're gonna limit the time you spend with them. Well, I don't really like that idea. Well, I don't really care because I'm the parent, you're the kid. So like, that's just how it's gonna roll. We didn't exactly say it that way, but the fact is who you spend a lot of time with, you'll start realizing you talk like them. You'll start realizing you think like them. You'll even notice husband and wife, it's very weird. Sometimes your mannerisms start to become like them. I, I think about Brandon and Brandy. Brandon happens to be my brother and Brandy is on staff here. And when Brandy and Brandy got married, they were not so much alike, but 10 years in, this is their 10 month anniversary, 10 year anniversary. All of a sudden Brandy's cracking jokes and we're like, that kind of sounds like Brandon. Like what the heck? Like that's not who you are, but it's because you spend time with someone, you start acting like that person. You ask yourself, man, am I fruit producing? Here's the question. Who are you hanging out with? Are you one? with Jesus? Are you in his word? Are you spending time with the father? Is it a chore to you? Is it something you just have to check off? It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know I'm supposed to read my Bible. Okay. You version click did it. Okay. I'm supposed to pray. So as I'm driving to work today, I'm just going to pray a little prayer. You know, as I, I can't eat. Oh my gosh. I'm having a frappe. Jesus bless his frappe. Like you're making it about rules and rituals. And that's what the old Testament was about guys. That's not what we're about. Jesus came so that we could have relationship. And he said, if, if you are one with me, the fruit that's gonna come out of you is gonna be a result of our oneness. The second benefit that he showed in this passage is that your prayers would be answered. How many of you guys wanna pray and know that God hears your prayers? You wanna see that your prayers are effective. We're gonna do another message on this, but that is one of the benefits is that when you pray, God hears and answers your prayer. And the third thing that he says in this passage is you will be filled with joy. It will be a natural overflow. So here's what I want to say as we wrap up today. Very practically, how do you have that oneness? How do you remain one with Jesus, with the Holy Spirit on the inside of you? Here's what it should look like, guys. When you wake up in the morning, what's the first thing you're thinking about? Are you saying, good morning, Jesus? Thank you for another day. When you lay your head on your pillow at night, do you naturally just end your day with, God, thank you for this day and my family and my children and your, this heart of gratitude? That's what it looks like to have oneness. When you have any downtime and you're walking from one place in your job to the next place, you're just having a conversation with Jesus. And if people walk past you, they would think you had a friend in your pocket because you're just talking and you don't even realize 
That's oneness. You, you take your word and you're so excited to have a few minutes on a break at work because you can't wait to get into your word. You don't want to leave the house without getting into your word because you're talking to your best friend. Not because it's a chore. Not because somebody told you you had to. Not because it's the right thing to do and you're chucking up some brownie points in heaven. But because you literally know this is your source of life. This is your source of strength. Here's what's so interesting, guys. The more you'll get into the word, the more you will know the character of God, the more you know the character of God, the more you begin to know who you are in Christ, which is what everybody wants to know. The more you'll understand what God's plan and God's purpose is. Like everything you want is found right here. But so many times the enemy keeps us so distracted and so busy and he makes this look like it's just something on a chore chart you need to check off. But you know what? When you really get into this, you'll begin to realize, man, this is my source of life. One day this week, man, I just opened my word. I had already done my Bible study. I just flopped it open and it it hits the Psalms naturally because it's right in the middle. I love David's writings. Man, David was running for his life. He had such a massive calling on his life, but he was running from Saul and he pins this, God, you are my refuge and my source of strength. Just one tiny little passage that I read and it just like infuses me with strength because I think, man, a refuge is like a hiding place. No matter what's going on, God, you just, you encompass us. You, you just completely put your arms around us. I can hide in you. You give me strength for my day. Guys, that's your source of life. Turning on a little worship and letting it just completely change the atmosphere in the room. That's kind of what it looks like to remain. Sister Poole, the woman that Brad was talking about when we opened, we watched her walk through some tough moments in her life. I remember when she had to have a procedure done. She had no family locally. Her husband was in heaven. Her children were in California. She was following the will of God to be in Joplin at this college teaching. And she had a procedure and needed to have someone at her home 24 hours a day for a few days. And the college students were like jumping at the opportunity to go stay in her home and to be around her because she, even in this moment, nothing but a smile on her face. I remember Brad and I having the opportunity to go to her home and to stay and to see all of these books that she had read about Jesus and to see her Bible next to her nightstand and to realize that even though she was in pain and even though she was going through so much, there was nothing in her voice that was like, God is not good. My God is so good. And she just overflowed with this joy that only came from being constantly in connection with Jesus. That's our prayer for you today is that one, you have that desire and two, that you just start getting into your word and realizing, man, he's your source of life. Without being connected to the vine, we are nothing. That branch cannot produce fruit on its own. If you break that branch off, it's good for nothing. But if you stay connected to Jesus, if you can stay connected to your source of strength throughout your day, you're going to realize you think differently. You start to talk differently. You start to act differently. You start to produce that fruit that comes from a life that is connected to Jesus. That's right. That's what we want for you today. And so let's, go, let's uh, spend a moment in prayer today as we wrap up today's service and just ask God to apply his word to our heart. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, for challenging us and stretching us. But we're also very grateful, God, that you desire to have relationship with us. We thank you, God, that you yourself are infatuated with us. And that we are all you think about. God, I just want to ask for you to just forgive us as we so oftentimes from day to day we just we get so busy with the things of our day God that we just we lose sight of you 
And I pray, God, that you would put a hunger and a desire in our hearts, God, to see you in front of everything else. And that we would have a drawing in our heart, a desire in ourselves, God, to want to be one with you, to be so interconnected, God, as the branches interconnected with the vine, that we would be one. And not only that we would be one, God, but that by the power of your Holy Spirit that we would bear much fruit. Produce in our lives and through our lives all of the wonderful fruit, God, that you want to see come forth, that we would bring you pleasure. And as a result, God, that we would be overflowing with joy that is unconditional, that is constant, that is unchanging because we recognize, God, that we are in you and you are in us and our hope is secured, our future is fixed. We belong to you, God. That's my prayer, Lord, for all of us watching online, for, that, for those of us in your house under the sound of my voice, that we would be one with you, that we would remain and abide in you. With heads bowed and eyes closed, the first step to making that happen is to know Jesus, is to have a relationship with Jesus, to, to have prayed that prayer of confession, to make Jesus Lord of your life. And if you haven't done that, I want to urge you right now, that is the most important decision you can ever make, making Jesus Lord of your life making heaven your home. And, and it comes by asking God to forgive you of your sins. We're sinners. We're all sinners. And we can only be saved and forgiven by his grace, what he's done on the cross. And through his resurrection, we are given life and life more abundantly. It's about believing that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. He's the son of God. It's only through him we can be saved. It's confessing with our mouths that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so today I want to give you that opportunity to make heaven your home, make Jesus Lord of your life by praying this salvation prayer with us. But before we pray this prayer, if you're watching online, I want you to just comment all in in the comment section below. If you're in this room, would you just raise your hand right now as we pray this prayer as a church family? If you're giving your life to Jesus, just go ahead and raise your hand and we're going to pray this prayer together. Father, forgive me my sins. I believe with all my heart, I with all of Jesus my is the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God. I confess with my mouth, I with my mouth today, today, Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is I make Him Lord of my life. I make Him Lord of my life. Help me to be one with You. Help me to be one with You. Help me to abide in You. Help me to abide. In you. Help me to bear much fruit. Help me to bear much fruit. That I would bring You pleasure. That I would bring You pleasure. And help me to be overflowing. With your, joy. with your joy. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. Amen.